ready to go. All right. So hi, everyone. As uh, Michael has introduced, I'm Yanan Wang. I'm a um, geologist, and uh, I'm involved in the fossil mineral meteorite world. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to give a little talk about the history of commercial, what's called commercial natural history, and uh, also tell you about how it's related to science and where things are going. And yeah, so let's begin. So what is the collector's market? What do people collect? So uh, in the natural history world, you have a lot of different things, including modern animals and stuff like that, but we're gonna focus in on minerals, fossils, and meteorites, since I'm a geologist and you guys are geoscientists probably. So yeah, why do people collect things? Because they're pretty, because they're interesting, because they found something as a kid and eventually it grew into a hobby or it grew into a career or it grew into uh, their research interests. So let's begin with a historical perspective. Uh, everyone probably can think of at least one famous fossil dealer and that's uh, Mary Anning. Mary Anning was from, she was, she was born in 1799 and her family was already in the fossil business. Her father, Richard, her mother, Molly, and her brother, Joseph. What they did is they found fossils and sold them for supplemental income. They lived in Lyme Regis, and that area had a lot of Jurassic fossils, which would get weathered out of cliffs, and they would collect them. And they would, the area also had lots of tourists, so it made for good sales. They would set up a table full of fossils at a local coach stop, and most of it was ammonites and belemites and fossil ichthyosaur vertebrae, and they were sold for about a few shillings, so today's equivalent of four American dollars were around there. Now, their first major find was an ichthyosaur skull that was found by Joseph Anning, and it me measured 1.3 meters long. And Mary, age 12, found the rest of the skeleton, which in total measured over five meters. Now this was sold for 23 pounds back then, which is the equivalent of 1900 Great British Pounds today or $2,700 US or $3,400 Australian dollars. And there's a sketch of that skull that was in a paper from 1814. Now in 1826 at the age of 27, Mary Anning opened her fossil depot, and there's a picture of that on the right. And uh, she continued selling fossils and making discoveries, although in the 1830s she started getting some economic difficulties, but a lot of scientists would help raise money for her. In December of 1830, she found and sold a new species of plesiosaur for 200, uh, 200 pounds, which is about 23,300 Great British Pounds today or 33,000 US dollars or 42,000 Australian dollars. And unfortunately, she lost all of her life savings in 1835. There's not too many specific details. She uh, might have been swindled or she might have been involved in the business dealing that she couldn't get her money back from. Uh, eventually, she passed away in 1847 from breast cancer. And there on the right is a picture of the Fossil Depot from 1909. And uh, her family, and relatives did continue running the business for a while. And unfortunately, this location today, they expanded the road, so they tore down that building, and what's left of it is a kebab shop, which I like looked up on Google Maps today, so, yep. Now, another famous dealer back in the day was Bryce McMurdo Wright. He started as a miner in the Cumberland region of England, and eventually moved to Liverpool and began selling minerals and fossils in 1842. He would buy up fossils from local collectors, uh, well, fossils and minerals from local collectors and miners, and then resell it. And he sold regularly to the British Museum and eventually opened a shop at first in Liverpool and then later in London. He sent out flyers advertising he had over 3,000 specimens, and by 1860, he had 10,000 specimens from around the world. He would collect, he would buy and sell from miners around the world and also trade with collectors from around the world so that he would have more specimens. 
And on the right, there's a drawing of uh, Richard Owen meeting Bryce McMurdo Wright Jr. Um, that uh, we don't know if this meeting ever took place, but it might have happened because they sold a lot of material to the British Museum. They also sold a lot of material to US collectors, including over 1,800 specimens to US collector uh, William Jeffries, who was a banker in Philadelphia in the 18, late 1800s. And eventually, Jeffries sold his collection to Andrew Carnegie in 1904 for 20,000 US dollars, which is $600,000 today. And that makes up a good section of the Carnegie Mineral Collection at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. And uh, one of the things that happens with specimens, especially in minerals, is that museums deaccession it. Now, in the picture on the lower left, you can see up in the upper left corner is a label from Bryce McMurdo Wright. And the upper right-hand corner is a label from William Jeffries after he had purchased the specimen. And then in the bottom right is a label from the Carnegie Museum. And then to the left is Collector's Edge, which is a mineral company that bought a portion of the museum's deaccession collection. And there's that specific specimen on the right, which I then purchased along with all of these labels a few years ago. <laughs> now, uh, Bryce McMurdo Wright Jr. was also a, was a mineralogist and he traveled throughout Europe collecting specimens for his father. And when his father passed away, he took over the business in 1875. And business was pretty good until 1885 this is because one, it became more difficult to source specimens cheaply. And Junior had a reputation for making fake minerals or creating fake labels for localities. And also one of the major causes of decline was that natural history became less of a hobby and became more of a profession. So you have all these natural sciences that were now professionalized so that it became less appealing to amateur collectors and what's known as the gentleman collector. So science became more formal and less of a hobby. Eventually, uh, Bryce McMurdo Wright declared bankruptcy in 1888. And another famous dealer uh, or famous uh, business was established by Henry, Henry August Ward. Now Ward traveled around the world building natural history uh, collections for museums and universities. He became a professor at the University of Rochester in New York in 1860, which time he established Ward's Natural Science. And they produced a variety of catalogs and casts of specimens and natural specimens, and mostly sold to museums, but occasionally was bought by collectors as well. Now, after a series of mergers and buyouts, that company, Ward's Natural Science Establishment, is actually still around today. Here are some examples of catalogs from the 1800s. On the left in the middle is one of their catalogs of fossil casts. And you can see for a few dollars, you could buy an entire fossil cast for display. On the right, a example of a catalog of, uh, of model invertebrates made out of glass. Wards eventually was responsible for creating basically a method to create loose site display specimens. So if you have like a, say a horseshoe crab encased in loose site, there's a chance it originated from wards. And uh, here's an example of a mineral specimen that I purchased at one point. It's a microcline or Amazonite. And it was from wards, purchased from wards in December of 1928. Now, there wasn't much happening for the next few decades because of the world wars and depression and all that. But by the 1950s, uh, rock collecting started becoming a hobby again. And then you have the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show start in 1955. And here's a picture of it from 1967. Over the next few decades, mineral, fossil, and meteorite collecting became more popular. And then you have one of the ways we've learn about what happened back then is via catalogs. So there's a catalog from Geological Enterprises which supplied fossils to collectors and researchers. And here's a catalog from 1973 and 1974. And on the right, you can see they basically listed things by invertebrate or vertebrate or plant and separated them by age and species. So you could 
have a good idea what things cost back then. Then in the 1990s, things kind of took off. Uh, there's the famous case of Sue the T-Rex, and it sold for $8.4 million at Sotheby's. Now, before this, dinosaurs were like expensive, but not that expensive. You could buy a T-Rex for about $500,000 to a million dollars, but suddenly dinosaurs were worth a lot of money. And over the next decade, natural history departments were established at Bonhams, Heritage, and other auction houses around the world. So that brings us to today, where minerals, fossils, and meteorites can be worth a lot of money. So where do commercial fossils come from? Well, first you have specific quarries. For example, in the Green River Formation in Wyoming, you have about a dozen quarries where they specialize in mining fossil fish. And then you have, you also have like uh, specific quarries for mining dinosaurs, mining ammonites, and a variety of fossils. Then you have recreational collecting where people collect fossils on beaches, such as at the Jurassic Coast or at the Calvert Cliffs where you find giant shark teeth. And then you have the byproducts of mining, byproducts of quarry. So in, like, in a lot of places, for example, anywhere you, where you have coal mines, you'll likely find fossils like fossil leaves and such. And they usually allow hobbyists in there when they're not operating. So what's the fossil market like? Well, uh, for new collectors, or they're usually interested in entry-level specimens. Ammonites, brachiopods, trilobites, dinosaur bones, shark teeth, usually items under $100. So here are a few examples. We've got Madagascar ammonites, which usually run about $5. We get amber from the Dominican Republic, which runs about $1.8 to $40. Then we've got fossil fish, where you have more common fish like Nydia, which costs five to twenty dollars and then you have rarer ones like Chrysocara which can go for about a hundred dollars or more. Now experienced collectors are interested in specific niches. They collect certain, they find something they're interested in and then they start collecting things within that niche. For example, I know collectors who only collect petrified wood. I know collectors who only collect fossil fish or collectors who are after one of each species of a certain group, like crinoids from a certain locality. And the price point can be up in the thousands. So here we have a praying mantis in amber for about $1,200. We have a piece of opalized petrified wood from Virgin Valley, Nevada, which I found myself, by the way, and that goes for like $600. And we got a fossil flower from uh, the Green River Formation that goes for about like up to $400. Now, wealthy collectors are typically interested in decor pieces. They want dinosaurs, ammonites, and pieces that they'll donate or loan to museums. So, for example, we have a uh, triceratops skeleton, complete and mounted, and I believe that one was uh, about 65% original material. That went for $657,000 at heritage auctions. Then we have Canadian amylite, which is one of the things that they specifically quarry for. That went for 43,000. Then we have a fossil palm leaf with fish from the Green River Formation that went for about 25,000. So what makes for value in fossils? Well, rarity. Vertebrate fossils are rarer than invertebrates and plants, and so they command a higher value. Preparation. Good preparation costs a lot of money. Uh, you could hire someone to prepare a fossil for like 25 hours an hour, but if you need highly skilled work, you're looking at 50 to $100 per hour. And completeness, completeness and aesthetics also increase value. So here you have a comparison of the $5 ammonite versus the $43,000 ammonite. And by the way, that $43,000 ammonite, ammonite is also uh, about like nearly a meter across. Next up, where do commercial meteorites come from? Well, first you have the ones that are found by meteorite hunters. Now, these are a number of people who specialize in tracking down meteorites. So 
they'll listen to the media and social media to find when there's a good meteorite fall. And then they'll actually try to locate where the meteorite fell. This using eyewitnesses, video, even uh, some weather satellite data. And they'll go to the locations and walk around hunting with a metal detector sometimes until they find the meteorites. Then there's the meteorites that are stumbled upon by farmers. These are, um, well, usually this is very common in the United States where a farmer's farming, they're plowing the earth and they keep hitting one large specific rock over and over every year until they're tired of it and they dig up the rock and it's usually a meteorite. Then you have meteorites found by nomads. Around the Sahara, in the Sahara Desert, you have a lot of communities that just move around a lot and there's a lot of rocks in the desert and occasionally some of the rocks they pick up are meteorites because they look very out of place. So for example, the picture on the right is a uh, new, relatively new meteorite that was found in the desert and that pic was sent to me by a friend of mine in Morocco to show me like what they came across. And that did turn out to be a new carbonaceous meteorite. So what's the meteorite market like? Well, you have entry level specimens, including unclassified meteorites, iron meteorites, and small bits of lunar and Martian meteorites, all of these usually under $100. So here we have a specimen of the Brenham Palisite for 60 bucks, a stony, common stony, stony meteorite for 20 bucks, and pectites, which are formed by meteorite impacts for like 10 bucks. Now, experienced collectors, once again, they start collecting niches. There's main mass collectors, which are collectors who want the largest piece of a specific meteorite. Then there are collectors who are after certain types and collectors after historic falls. And the price point can increase a lot at that point. So here's the example of a main mass NWA 10494 uh, for $1,500. That is the largest chunk of that specific meteorite. The rest of that meteorite was cut up into slices. In the center, there's a example of a palisite, Gloriata Mountain. And on the right, uh, early Canyon Diablo meteorite, which is from Meteor Crater, Arizona. And on that one, it has a label from uh, Albert Foote, who was the mineral dealer from about 1900. So with a lot of this material, you could actually date it based on the labeling. Now, wealthy collectors are interested in decor pieces, very attractive pieces, pieces for with bragging rights or museum purposes. So on the left there, you have a very attractive Gibeon meteorite for $53,000. And below there's a very large slice of an Imalak meteorite, a palisite for $25,000. And that one is a museum display specimen. On the right, you have a lunar meteorite that for whatever reason went for a lot of money. It's, uh, we're still not sure why that went for that much. Uh, we suspect uh, someone really likes spheres and that's a sphere made of a lunar meteorite. How big is it? The, the sphere? Yeah. Uh, uh, two inches across, like seven centimeters. Okay, so it's not that big. <laughs> no, it's, we, we expected it to only go up to 20,000. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so why, what makes for value in meteorites? Well, rarity, lunar Martian meteorites are rarer than other types. Uh, size, larger meteorites are actually worth less per gram. So a 50 gram meteorite could be worth $10 per gram, but one gram of the same one could be worth $30 a gram. This is because a lot of people can't afford a complete meteorite, so they'll be happy with just a small piece of it. So what often happens is a lot of large meteorites get smashed into very small pieces so that they can be distributed throughout the market. Then there's aesthetics, pretty looking things. Provenance, like meteorites with old labels and old attachments go for better money. And also museum and trade value, a lot of museums are interested in new meteorites and they'll trade you extra meteorites they have. <laughs> so you can suddenly have a museum labeled meteorite that's worth a lot of money for something you picked up fairly cheaply because the museum really wants the new stuff. Now down on the bottom left is an interesting meteorite. That's Calculon Creek, which is the first lunar meteorite 
found outside of Antarctica. So lunar meteorites are caused when a large meteor hits the moon, knocks off a chunk of the moon, and that chunk falls to Earth. Yakalong Creek was actually found by, uh, uh, by Aboriginal people who were hunting for Milbalili meteorites, which are a different meteorite fall that occurred in the 1960s. So that was part of a lot of meteorites they had found and then sold to a meteorite dealer, Robert Hack. Robert Hack cut it open, was like, this is weird looking, and tested it and it turned out to be a lunar meteorite. And Calcalon Creek is possibly one of the most expensive meteorites per gram, uh, which with it, I've heard of it going for about up to $100,000 per gram. Now, on the right, an example of a meteorite with provenance. So this one has several numbers on it. The top number is by Harvey Neininger, who was the father of American meteoritics. Then you got Oscar Monig, who was a researcher in Texas who collected a lot of meteorites. Then you have Walton, who's a different researcher at a different university who purchased this meteorite and then put his own number on it. And so this trail of numbers gives you both historic provenance and also increases the value because people like to know that a certain collector or a certain researcher had the meteorite at some point. So now we come to minerals. Where do commercial minerals come from? Well, first you have commercial miners and artisanal miners. A lot of this occurs around the world where they're mining for a specific mineral or attractive minerals. In the picture below, you have people mining for road across site at Sweet Home Mine of Colorado. Then you have the byproducts of large scale mining. What happens is you have a large quarry where they're mining for limestone or they're mining for lead or some other ore and the miners would take out specimens in their lunch boxes. So occasionally they come across a really attractive specimen of fluoride or galena or some other crystal and they'll put it in their lunch box and take it out and then sell it to uh, commercial mineral dealers. Then you have hobby collecting at various locations where you can hunt for rocks and minerals yourself. For the beginning le beginner level collectors, they're after quartz, calcite, labradorite, tumbled minerals, unique, min uh, basically things that are pretty. And these are usually under $100. You've got like, quartz from Arkansas on the left for $10, formerly crystals from Brazil for $20, Amazon night from Madagascar for, yeah. And then after that, now experienced collectors, once again, they have their niches. They want specific types, uh, pieces from specific mines, different groupings of minerals from specific locations. Uh, on the left's a road to site from the Sweet Home Mine for $500. In the middle is a barrel crystal aquamarine with some tourmaline from Sunat, M Namibia for $600. And there are a lot of collectors who only collect minerals from Sumeb. Then you have a Colorado Smoky Quartz and Aquamarine, which is another classic mineral locality that people are after. Then you have the wealthy collectors who want one, the core pieces, two, best of pieces, and then pieces that they'll donate to museums just because uh, they like the notoriety or they believe a museum should have it. And yeah, for some reason, minerals seem to be the thing that they most the mo has the most money in terms of donation to museums. For, uh, here's an example. This is the candelabra tourmaline from California. And it's in the, currently in the Smithsonian. That piece is about half a meter across. And this is uh, based on hearsay and lore, the most expensive mineral ever sold. It's sold for $25 million and was donated to the Smithsonian. Why is it worth that? It's a blue cap tourmaline, which are extremely rare. Blue cap as in it has that blue cap on top with the red main body. And that's uh, interesting formation with three of the crystals in one piece with quartz and other minerals. So what makes for value in minerals? Well, rarity, certain minerals are only found in a handful of places on earth. Uh, Benito oil in California, for example. Size, larger usually is more valuable. Perfection. This is a really important point with high-end collectors. A specimen must be perfect. A perfect specimen of quartz with no chips, no dings, no imperfections is worth 10 times more than something with just a slight chip. 
localities. Some localities are just worth more than others. And provenance, old labels, old collections, museum labels, they make a specimen worth more. So here's an example of a $20 Canadian rotocrosi versus a $385,000 Sweet Home rotocrosi from Colorado. And that Sweet Home piece, that's about oh, 10 centimeters across. So how many dealers are there in the natural history world? Well, for meteorites, there are about 50 to 100 dealers. Fossils, you got 100 to 200, and minerals, you've got 1,000 to 1,500 dealers. So the Tucson show started in 1955, and it started with just 15 dealers, and it grew to over 5,000 dealers today, including jewelry dealers, with 50,000 buyers. And this is the main trade show for the industry that meets in Tucson, Arizona every year in January and February. And here's some pics I took from uh, Tucson, uh, the Tucson show. You can see booths of jewelry and minerals and fossils taking up entire convention centers. And they'll even set up giant tents measuring kilometer, a kilometer long full of dealers everywhere throughout the city. And they also convert several hotels to trade shows by turning the hotel rooms into trade show booths. And here you can see an entire selection of ammonite, amyloid ammonites, or you can see giant quartz crystals. Those are like, those are meter tall quartz crystals on the right there from Brazil. And they'll bring all of this into Tucson. All right, so now for the science aspect. How does each of these groups associate with science? Well, Fossil dealers often work with scientists because they dig up a lot of interesting new stuff and they like to partner with scientists to write up the material. On the left there is a triarthrous trilobite with preserved antennae and legs. Now, this was found by Marcus Martin, who was a hobbyist, who, found, who was reading papers about the old localities in New York and was like, okay, if this type of shale has recorded trilobites with legs in the past, I should be able to find another deposit of this somewhere else. And that's what he did. He eventually found another deposit in upstate New York and worked a deal with the landowner and has been quarrying all these trilobites with amazing preservation. And not only that, he developed a technique to prepare this material using a sandblaster, blasting 40 micron dust at this material to reveal the trilobite without destroying it. And he's made several major discoveries there that he's written up, including trilobites carrying eggs. Uh, on the right there is a fossil crane fly. I found that in amber, uh, well, probably about two years ago, and during World Crane Fly Day, I posted it on Twitter, and a scientist named George Maderos got back to me and was like, hey, that's, uh, we've never written up a crane fly in Dominican amber before, and so, Two years later, we have a new paper describing the crane fly in amber for the first time from the Dominican Republic. <laughs> and then you have uh, the Green River Formation, which has fantastic material. You have left there a complete horse that was found in one of the quarries. And that's currently on display at the Smithsonian. And on the right there is another specimen that I was sort of involved in. About a decade ago, I bought a fossil assassin bug half from Dan Judd, who was a fossil dealer at the Tucson show. And initially I was gonna resell it, but then I was like, hmm, maybe I should check with my research friend. So I sent a picture to my friend, uh, Sam Heads, and he was like, wow, that's outstanding. We haven't had fossil, a fossil assassin bug paper on the Green River Formation before. So a few years later, voila, we have a paper on fossil assassin bugs from the Green River Formation and uh, this is also uh, one of the fossil insects that has uh, genitalia preserved, amazingly. All right, now mineral dealers find a lot of new minerals. They collect a lot of locations and they have the, some of them have the equipment to check it out. Like there are several mineral dealers I know who actually have their own scanning electron microscopes. So they do work to find new minerals, and every year about 100 new minerals are proposed to, uh, to science. And uh, mineral dealers and collectors also contribute to museum displays. A lot of major museums 
uh, probably the majority of their display pieces are from collectors or dealers who donated specimens. And they also supply researchers with rare specimens. So here we have my buddy Alfredo Petrov, who's written several articles on various minerals. He's also a mineral dealer specializing in really oddball minerals. And on the right is Alfredo Petrovite, which was a mineral discovered a few years ago that they decided to name after him in honor of him for all his work. Now, meteorites are really interesting. So meteorites, they're not official until you donate 20% or 20 grams, whichever is less, or excuse me, whichever is uh, yeah, the lesser number. So they have to donate a piece of it to a scientific repository in order for it to be an official meteorite. Otherwise, it's just an unclassified meteorite and it has significantly lower value. So meteorite hunters are happy to go out there, find new meteorites, and cut off a piece for science. And so a lot of the research today being done on meteorites are all from commercial specimens, including like material from lunar specimens and Martian specimens. And while yes, they do have a lot of meteorites from Antarctica, it's a lot less paperwork to just get it from a commercial dealer. So since the um, majority of you are in Australia, I figure I show, let's see what's uh, popular from Australia. Well, first of all, opal. Of course, Australia has a lot of opal and a lot of it gets turned into jewelry, but you also have rough specimens that are, are aesthetically pleasing, like this one, which is, um, it was, well, it was much nicer in person. It looks like a, it looked like a whole bunch, it basically looked like a frozen ocean. This one sold for $21,000. Uh, Australia has a lot of really big gold nuggets, and gold nuggets are worth about 50% more than their value in gold, especially if they're large and good looking. Uh, uh, for some reason, the uh, Maramamba Tiger Iron is very popular. So this two meter slab sold for $215,000. And then there's a bunch of uh, weird stuff from Australia. You have like zebra rock. So here's a sphere made of zebra rock that was about uh, 10 centimeters across. And then you have your classic uh, Jack Hill zircon with some of the old, oldest crystals in the world. And that stuff sells for probably like $30 a gram just for the rock itself. Then you have various minerals like crockite, which is very popular from uh, Tasmania. And of course, meteorites, if they're properly exported. You have the Mibilili meteorites, which are from the fall in the 1960s. Then you have your Hembury meteorites, which are from the Hembury craters, which are now protected, but there used to be a lot of them here that came out. So how does one get into sand rocks? Well, for myself, I started with a few as a kid, and then I bought some, and I sold some of the older ones to buy more and so on and so forth until you became a dealer. <laughs> then there's uh, buying old collections. A lot of old mineral, fossil, meteorite collections come up for sale every year. And if you happen to be able to buy one of them, you can basically make a lot of money from it. Then there's trading with museums. Museums won't trade fossils, but they're quite happy to trade minerals and meteorites. They, it's to them, like minerals don't have as much research value as long as you already have one sample. So they're willing to trade that. And same with meteorites. They just need a sample of each meteorite. They don't need several kilos of a specific meteorite. Uh, then there's finding a new deposit. If you go out there, you can find new deposits of minerals. Uh, a few years ago, someone found a deposit of tranquilliite out in uh, Australia, and that's pretty rare or you could find an old deposit. Oftentimes you could go through really old literature from the early 1900s and find locations for minerals or fossils that people have forgotten about. So what's the future like? Uh, I suspect there's going to be spikes in certain minerals because of social media. On the right is Moldavite, a gem glass that's formed by a meteor impact that's found in Czechoslovakia, uh, excuse me, the Czech Republic. Now, prior to 2020, uh, you could get Moldavite for about $4 a gram. But then um, 
Moldavite suddenly became real popular on the witchcraft portion of TikTok. And now it's worth about $40 a gram and the price is still climbing. Uh, people will uh, in the future continue buying minerals for metas metaphysical purposes. And dinosaurs will probably get more expensive. Now, Sue the T-Rex sold for $8.4 million back in 1997, but Stan in 2020 sold for $31 million, which none of us in the industry were expecting. We were expecting like another eight to 10 million at most, and, but it's over 31 million, which indicates that high-end natural history might be considered art. You have aesthetically pleasing minerals, meteorites and fossils, which are very high value. So at some point it might be considered an art form. Now, what I've noticed over the past few years is that ethical considerations are becoming more mainstream. People want to know if their minerals are supporting conflict. Uh, just last year, there was a call by scientists to start to stop publishing on Amber from Myanmar. And this year, of course, Myanmar is going into civil war, basically. So it's complicated, but there will be much more discussion on ethical considerations in collecting in the near future. And that's it. Credit to various parties, Heritage Auctions, Wikipedia, Ward Project, Tucson, and others. So I will open it up for questions now. 